welcome you here tonight. We have a very special night for us. We do this twice a year. Uh, and after evening services tonight, we will have a graduate. We'll present him in just a moment. Uh, but we always have a good lesson right before that. And uh, it's been so long since I've been up here. Do I switch the screen over with this one, or is it done back there? Well, they're not, they're not looking, so I'll just try that. Maybe that's it. But then again, oh, that was it, all right. Sure enough, there you go. All right. But um, when we think about the Florida School of Preaching, it's, we're, in our, we're actually, well, around our 50th year, on the tail end of that, maybe even to our 51st year. But we started in September 1969. And so this actually is uh, coinciding with our 50th year at the end of this semester, which we just ended Friday. And uh, during that time, the South Florida Avenue Congregation has been a great help. In fact, uh, we've always had this address, 1807. Uh, the whole fellowship wing and the classrooms of the school was built in 1980, uh, specifically for the school, although the church uses that quite a bit as well, at least the fellowship room in the kitchen. And for that, we're very appreciative. And tonight, uh, later on, Brother Casey Paulin will graduate uh, formally, officially, quote unquote, and uh, he grew up here. Uh, this is his home congregation, his parents, uh, Stacy and Michelle, and grandparents, uh, Paul and Barbara Paulin, and several cousins and nieces and nephews and all kinds of stuff with that. Uh, but this is a good opportunity for us to think about mission-minded ministers, mission-minded ministers. And our young people and some of the older people uh, yesterday went over to Bushnell, the National Cemetery over there, and did some wonderful things and helping to decorate some of the graves. Our children learned, our adults uh, learned, uh, very emotional for some, uh, some not as emotional, but yet a good thing that we did. And we often pray for our military and our first responders, which is a good thing. Uh, however, if we pray more for the military, but not the missionaries, then uh, perhaps we do not really understand the nature of the warfare in which all souls all over the world at this very moment are engaged. And that is, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, and that is where the real battle takes place. And so you'll understand maybe the title of this lesson, the significance or the... the um, Relevance, I should say, of this tonight as we go through our services tonight. But when we think of mission-minded ministers in our text, as you can see, it's going to be Acts chapter 18, so if you want to turn your Bibles there, we often uh, get the wrong impression thinking that only the ministers, the preachers, are to be mission-minded. And so we will include with this the members, mission-minded ministers and members. And so all of us uh, have a, a stake in the lesson tonight and in being pleasing to God. Well, in Acts chapter 18, uh, verse 24 through 28, let us read that together. Now, a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he only knew the baptism of John. Now keep that in mind. He only knew the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue when Aquila and Priscilla heard him. They took him aside and explained unto him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. And so Apollos is a very interesting person. And uh, really, when you think of, well, at least when I graduated from the Florida School of Preaching back in 1991, and all the new ministers, in fact, we have ministers in here that graduate from the school as well, and others that graduated from other schools of preaching, uh, which is a good thing. And, uh, you know, one of the first things when you get a local work is, well, what do I put on my business card? You know, my little business card here, do I put minister? Do I put preacher? Do I put evangelist? And uh, there's a whole number of terms we could put on that, but the card is that size and, you know, depends, you know, what you want to emphasize or whatever. But all of those things apply uh, to a preacher of the gospel. And when we think of Apollos, he is here now in Ephesus. He is going to go on to Corinth, 
Paul's going to follow him in chapter 19 and correct some things, if you will. Um, but he was both an eloquent speaker, but yet he went around with Paul, sometimes without Paul. He is called for in Titus, we'll look at. And so he was a very active brother in the church working with Paul, both preaching and evangelizing. So here is Apollos, who is a preacher, a minister, an evangelist, all of those things, and many other terms we could use for him. But we want to look at five qualities about him or characteristics about him that all of us who want to be mission-minded ministers and members uh, can have in our lives as well. And the first of these is that Apollos was prepared. He was a prepared individual. Now, th this would make a whole lesson by itself, but notice, and I counted nine of these things here in that text we just read, Acts 18, 24 through 29. Well, first of all, let me say he was born in Alexandria, which was one of the top learning centers of the first century Greco-Roman world. They had one of, if not the largest, library known to man at that time. Uh, so he was from that, that seat of learning in the ancient world. But notice he was an eloquent man. He was mighty in the scriptures. He was instructed in the way of the Lord. He was fervent in spirit. He taught accurately with one little flaw. He spoke boldly in verse 26. He, uh, verse 27, he greatly helped those who believe. Verse 28, he vigorously refuted. And also in verse 28, he showed from the scriptures Jesus was the Christ. So here is a very talented man, a very talented person in the gospel. But yet, when we think about him, all of us may not be eloquent like him. All of us may not have had the educational opportunities he had. All of us may not fit into every single one of those characteristics, or at least those points that we read about his, his preaching and his abilities. But what Apollos does tell us is that we should let the Lord use us and mold us for his service, no matter what our background is. Uh, many of the apostles were fishermen, uneducated, at least by the world standards. Uh, some of them, like Matthew, was a tax collector. Uh, others uh, were other professions, but yet they allowed the Lord to use them and use them in their backgrounds and, and their, their, to mold them and use them in whatever way he saw fit. And we come from various backgrounds, those of us who are here tonight, um, educationally, culturally, all kinds of different backgrounds. Uh, some of us had pretty bad pasts, uh, but yet we turn to the Lord. Others of us were maybe brought up in a Christian home and have attended faithful, sound congregations all of our lives. But it doesn't matter because God can take whatever our past is, good or bad, and he can use that for his service if we would just allow him to do so. And so Apollos had great opportunities, great advantages that others did not, but not everybody from Apollos' background served the Lord like he did. And so he allowed the Lord to mold him and use him. He also, one of the main features of those nine things I read off is that, you know, he learned the scripture and he learned to communicate that to others. And again, all of us may not have the, 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 the tongue. In fact, we sing that song sometimes. I may not preach. I may not sing like angels. I may not preach like Paul, but we can still do something for the Lord. And uh, we can all learn the scriptures. And uh, we begin most Sunday evenings with the children right up here in the front. Adults are invited to that as well. That's all about learning scriptures. It's never, you're never too young, you're never too old to learn what the book says. And so he was prepared, and we ought to be prepared as well. We ought to be about the business of preparing ourselves. Notice, secondly, he was enthusiastic. He was enthusiastic. Uh, verse 25 mentions he was fervent in spirit, and that word fervent there is zealous. Literally means boiling over, but we do know, for example, from Romans that he that that zeal must be based in knowledge. In Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, Paul recounts his brethren, his kinsmen according to the flesh, that uh, he wishes that they could be saved, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. 
And so zeal without knowledge can be a very dangerous thing. For verse 3 says, they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Misguided zeal not only, um, not only does not follow truth, but it can become a, an obstacle. It, be, it can become an enemy to truth. And you think about some of these religions, some of these world religions, some of these cults and existence uh, in the world today. And I guarantee you, those people that are in those are very zealous. Cannot question that. Most of them that are zealous are very sincere. But yet it's misguided. It's zeal, but not according to knowledge. And when, that, when people have that, they set up their own systems of righteousness. But are those systems, do they have the ability to save us? Of course not. They are systems without knowledge. And notice also involved with that zeal is teaching accurately the word of truth. And But we do have, as I pointed out at the end of verse 25, it says he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord. But there's that comma, knowing only the baptism of John. And so he taught accurately, but that doesn't mean he was perfect in every way. And uh, this will kind of lead us into our next point here, but there's a difference between teaching falsely and a false teacher. And what I mean by that, a person can mistake something and think he's teaching the truth, but really not. But when he comes to a knowledge of the truth, he changes. That's okay. But a person who teaches false doctrine... And even though it's pointed out, here's the truth, a persistent false doctrine, that's a false teacher that must be marked after the second and third admonition, etc., and the other passages there. But we ought to be enthusiastic about the Lord, but yet that enthusiasm, that zeal, must be grounded in truth. And that's how Apollos was. And then thirdly, our third point, he was humble. He was humble. Again, uh, in verse 26, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately, or as the old King James says, more perfectly. Now think of the humility of a man to be corrected like that. Here's a man mighty in the scriptures. Here's a man that's very eloquent. Here's a man that is speaking boldly, um, eloquent, uh, all those things we read earlier, but yet he was wrong on that point. He only knew the baptism of John. And if you only know the baptism of John and not the Great Commission baptism, there's a lot of other things that are going to go wrong in that. And, of course, we don't have time tonight to get into chapter 19, but Paul will come and he'll find these brethren that were baptized under John's baptism, and he had to teach them the truth of the gospel the Great Commission baptism, which in a nutshell, John's baptism looked forward to what Christ would do, and it was, it had its place uh, at one time uh, during the lifetime of Jesus, but Great Commission baptism looked back at what Christ already did. And so there is a difference there that Paul succinctly or summarizes in chapter 19 uh, and verse 4. But that's another lesson of itself. But notice, who took him aside? Aquila and Priscilla uh, is what the King James and the New King James says and a few others, but there are some translations and based upon some manuscript that have Priscilla's name first. And usually in the Greek text they would put words in order of emphasis, uh, but anyway, that's another study by itself. But a woman was involved in teaching Apollos the way of God more accurately. Now, not only was he eloquent, not only was he mighty, mighty and powerful in the scriptures, but now a woman is helping her husband teach him the way of God more perfectly. You see the humility that requires. And there are some who would be in Apollos' position and say, you can't teach me anything. I've been a member of this church for 40 years. I'm an elder. I'm a preacher. I'm eloquent. You can't teach me that. I'm sticking with it. The baptism of John. But that wasn't Apollos. He was shown the truth. And uh, he changed. Of course, you see in verse 27, right after that, when he desired to cross into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. 
Now, he doesn't tell us everything that happened between verse 26 and 27, but he obviously repented. He obviously started teaching the truth. And because after Acts, he's still a faithful co-worker of Paul. Unlike others, like Hymenaeus and Alexander in 2 Timothy 2, who said the resurrection was past, Demas, 2 Timothy 4, verse 10, he's gone back to the world. And so there were some co-workers of Paul that didn't continue, though they did at one time. But Apollos, was a co-worker with Paul, taught a little error, was corrected, repented, taught the truth, and went on to be a continual valuable co-worker. But we need to have the humility that was seen in Apollos uh, to be a mission-minded minister as well as a mission-minded member. And so he was prepared, was Apollos. Uh, he was zealous according to knowledge, and he was humble. Fourthly notice, and we're going to leave uh, Acts 18 for a moment, and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, what Josh read for us just a moment ago, uh, who, by the way, is a brother-in-law of Casey. And, uh, but anyway, uh, that's just a, for your information, pretty cool. But anyway, in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 5, and of course in this section of 1 Corinthians chapters 1 through 4, Paul is addressing um, division in Corinth. And that division, according to chapter 3, verse 3, has to do with their carnality, their worldly thinking. And uh, <clears throat> that carnality comes out a little bit in various sections in that section and even throughout the epistle. But in chapter 3, uh, you know, if you go back to chapter 1, verse 12, you know, I'm of Paul, I'm of Paulus, I'm of Cephas. Their carnal mindset was elevating preachers above where they ought to be. And by the way, it's not always the preacher's fault that people elevate him. Just keep that in mind. It wasn't Paul's fault. It wasn't Paul's. It wasn't Cephas and Peter's fault. But that's the way carnal mind thinks. So he's my preacher. I'm after him. And we, we of course, can get that way too. That's another lesson, but just stick to the book and we'll be all right. Uh, it's the message, not so much the messenger, although we do like our, we have our favorite messengers and that's all right, just as so long as we don't like them to the exclusion of other faithful ministers. Uh, but anyway, that's another lesson by itself. And so Paul is saying here that rather than putting men on a pedestal, God should be on the pedestal. We preachers, we ministers, we are just servants of God. And so in verse 5 he says, So who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers? And that's the word diakonos, the same word we get deacon from, which really just means a minister. Of its 40 occurrences in the New Testament, only three of those refer to the deacon. The others are just a servant in general. In fact, all Christians should be diakonoses, that is, general servants of God, uh, though they don't meet, maybe meet the qualifications for that special servant deacon. But notice we are just ministers. We don't belong up here. But we belong down here. And as I mentioned on this word before, that word diakonos, you know, back in classical Greek and all that, in its etymology, it just simply meant a table waiter, a lowly servant. And, of course, by the time the New Testament came along, it was to refer to as ministers. And incidentally, if you look in chapter 4, verse 1, he gives two other words. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ, and that is a slave, an under rower, and stewards of the mysteries of God. And so a minister, a servant, a steward. That's not what you find up here, but that's what you find down here. Christ ought to be up here, and servants down here. So that's the context. Now going back to 3 and verse 5, notice, um, notice who is Paul, who is Apollos, but ministers to whom you believe. I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase, so neither is he who plants anything or he who waters but God. Sometimes we can get our focus too much on the ministers, on the preachers, on, the, on those servants. But really, they're just planters, they're just waterers. All of us are just planters and waterers, but it's God that gives the increase. Now, he who plants and he who waters are one. Notice they're two, but they're one because it's the same cause. You can't have produce without somebody planting, somebody watering, and God giving the sunshine and the rain, and God giving the increase. But it's all about God. He who plants, he who waters are one, and each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are his field. You are his building. Ministers, mission-minded ministers, mission-minded members, they don't think of themselves as the head honcho. Uh, I know some places the preacher thinks he's the head honcho. Maybe one of the elders will think, I'm the head honcho. I'm the boss. 
do what I say. The gavel. Uh, but that's not the way a mission-minded minister or member is. Notice they are dependent upon God. Yes, one plants, one waters, but it's God who gives the increase. Let God do his work. Let us plant water, encourage, etc., so that seed, but God will give it. And then notice, unified with the faithful. The water, the planter, are one together in the same work. God, again, gives the increase. So a team player is somebody who does that. Doesn't think of himself or herself as the chief person in charge, but yet is a servant of God. Uh, dependent upon God, unified with God. And so a mission-minded minister or member is prepared. It is one uh, who is uh, zealous, one who is a team player, and, of course, uh, one that is humble. And notice, as we wrap it up here, he is also reliable. In fact, that word faithful, uh, one of the definitions of that word is reliable. And if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16, very interesting that beginning in chapter 7, verse 1 of 1 Corinthians, there's this phrase, now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me. And so that phrase occurs about six or seven times from chapter 7 all the way through the end of 1 Corinthians. And it involves things that the Corinthians wrote to Paul. They wrote a letter to Paul asking him some of these questions. We don't have that letter. All we have is Paul's answers to their questions. You know, about the Lord's Supper, about the resurrection, about spiritual gifts, about uh, head covering and all that kind of stuff. Well, the last question in, dealt with in 1 Corinthians is in verse 12. Now concerning... Our brother Paul, now concerning our brother Paul, or, or Apollos, our brother Apollos. So they had written about Apollos. Can you imagine that? Now, again, Apollos was mentioned back in chapter 1. Some were dividing themselves under Paul, under Apollos, under Cephas. But now he says concerning our brother Apollos. So they wrote unto him, I strongly urged him to come to you with the brethren, but he was quite unwilling to come at this time. However, he will come <coughs> when he has a convenient time. And so evidently they had written Paul, telling Paul to tell Apollos to come back to Corinth. Uh, but it wasn't according to Apollos' will at that time. And I think there's a lesson there for us. Um, well, let me see. I didn't do my thing, did I? All right. There's a lesson there for us. Of course, that first point, spending time with people. Apollos was in Ephesus. He spent time there. He spent time in Corinth. Uh, he was a faithful co-worker uh, with Paul. Uh, in fact, the Titus 3.13 passage there has to do with uh, Paul. When he wrote to Titus, he told Titus to bring or to send Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their journey uh, with haste that they may uh, bring back uh, nothing but Anyway, so they, you know, he called for him at, at, when he wrote to Titus. But um, that 1 Corinthians 16, 12 passage, you know, uh, members and ministers, they have to be willing to do the work. And uh, sometimes we pressure, well, you got to do this. You're the preacher. you got to do this. Or you're a member of that congregation. you got to do that. And it is true we have responsibilities, and sometimes there's a fine line between encouraging people to do what God expects them to do Versus forcing them to do something against their will. But there is a place for our own willingness to go. And it was not Apollos' will at the time they wrote the question to go back to Corinth. Maybe he wanted things to settle down a little bit because after all they just, you know, I'm a Paul, I'm of Apollos. So maybe he wanted that to cool down a little bit, I don't know. But whatever the reason, he did not choose to take that work, if you will. And so whether he came back or not, probably did. But at this time, he was not willing, says Paul. And also a reliable servant is faithful until death. Unto death, actually. And uh, we know the Revelation passage probably quite well. Be thou faithful unto death, I'll give thee a crown of life. 
Uh, and we, that, I've heard it here several times from the preachers here, but that doesn't mean just be faithful until you die. But that means be faithful even if death results from your faithfulness. I uh, mentioned Antipas, uh, Revelation chapter 2, 13, in the beginning of this lesson. And that's one who literally was faithful unto death. But they slew him because of his belief and his, his Christianity. And uh, Titus, or excuse me, Apollos was also faithful. And again, that word faithful within that definition is loyal, reliable. And again, Titus 3.13, bring Zenos or send Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their journey. In other words, Paul wanted to see them. Uh, they would be valuable to him. And so uh, he was still reliable. He could still be counted on in the work of the Lord. And so can we be counted on? in the work of the Lord, whether we're ministers, whether we're members of the South Florida Avenue congregation or whatever congregation we are here visiting from, are we reliable? So mission-minded ministers and members, they are prepared. How prepared are we tonight to teach the gospel? How prepared are we tonight to become a Christian? Do we know what's required of us to be saved? And I guarantee if you're a member here and you've attended with any regularity, you know exactly what we must do to be saved. To believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, John 8, 24. Repent of our sins, Luke 13, 3 and verse 5. To make our confession that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, 2 Timothy 2, 19, Romans 10, 10. To be immersed, baptized in water for the mission of our sins, Acts 2, 38. Again, if you know that, you have not done that, and you're of an accountable age, why not tonight do that? Be prepared for eternity. But if you've done that in the past, you have not been living faithfully, come back to Christ. Prepare yourself to be a servant of God, to be a faithful member of His church, of the local congregation, wherever you are from. But do that. Be prepared. Then you can be enthusiastic. Have we lost our zeal? Remember the uh, church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2 lost their first love. Uh, and so we need to restore that if we've lost our enthusiasm. Are we humble enough to learn from others? Even if it's someone that we may consider an inferior, which we shouldn't think that way in the body, but maybe a child can come and teach us. Would we accept truth if a child taught us? Um. We should be about truth, not pride, not arrogance, but humble enough to accept the truth no matter who teaches it to us. Are we team players for the cause of Christ? Willing to work together, cooperative, helping the Lord's body to grow in whatever talents, whatever way we can. Um, several of you do all kinds of things behind the scenes. I pointed out in the bulletin, Brother Lee Glenn, a couple weeks ago, but he's just one example among many in this congregation that do things behind the scene. You'd never know it except for, well, if you got inside information like I got sometimes, I'm here and I see it stuff being done, but you would never know it except the event flows flawlessly. The building has this or whatever. There's a lot of people working behind the scenes. We appreciate every one of them, but those are team players. Uh, they don't have to get the glory. They don't have to have their name on the marquee or in the bulletin. But they are there. They're going to help no matter what. And that's the kind of people the Lord needs, ministers and members. And then finally, are we reliable? Can God depend on us? There's a great war going on out there against uh, principalities and powers. All of us are involved. And all of us have a role to play in that, uh, to fight off the enemy, to save souls, to bring people to Christ. And so tonight, if you're not as mission-minded as you need to be, whether minister or member, and if you need to come forward to repent of sin, to confess uh, things, to rededicate your life to Christ, we have a great opportunity. There's lots of work for us to do. The Lord will find a way for us. If we are prepared, if we're enthusiastic, if we're humble, if we're team players, and if we are reliable. So tonight, if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we'd invite you to come as we stand and sing this song.